Now it is my privilege to um, bring to the stage um, a guy who's been up here a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. You know, last week he was introducing his dad on his 61st anniversary of his 29th birthday. And then before that he was on a panel. Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our main program today, our member, John Bridge. Well, I have to thank, thank Tom. This is, yeah, I, I, I hope you're not too bored with having me up here every once in a while. I have a really distinct honor to introduce to you and especially to our Winners for Life, someone who is a true winner for life, Ron Sims. Ron um, is a close friend, I think, of mine, and I hope he feels the same way. Ron, Ron um, was born a long time ago, not as, almost as long as I was born. Um, in Spokane, Washington. So he didn't grow up here. He went to Lewis and Clark High School. Some of you guys may have played Lewis and Clark at one point or another. He attended Central Washington University in Ellensburg and received a BA in psychology. And you know, after college, he managed to get himself elected to, um, to the King County Council. And beyond that, he got elected, appointed first, and then elected several times to three elections, by the way, as county executive here in King County. He cares greatly about our youth. That's one of his passions, is to care for all of you guys that are out there, all of our winners for life. You know, aside from his being King County executive, he was picked up by our president, Barack Obama, to be the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Well, he left that position because he really cares about our area here in the Northwest and moved back to, um, to Seattle and has now become a civic volunteer par excellence. And I don't think that this is a retirement mode, not when he serves as chair of the Washington State Health Benefit Exchange Board. You guys have all heard of the Affordable Care Act. Well, he runs that here in the state. And we're doing a great job thanks to Ron's activity. He's on the Board of Regents of Washington State University and um, he serves on the Puget Sound Leadership Council and the Board of Directors of the Washington Health Alliance. Realize that he managed to save all of us here in King County a whole bunch of money because he knows how to provide good health care to our workers in King County by giving them the opportunity, giving them the great opportunity to do a little bit of exercise and care for them, themselves during their working time. Uh, Ron and his wife, Cayenne, live right here in, uh, in Seattle in the Mount Baker district, and they have three sons. And without further ado, you don't want to hear me anymore. You want to hear from Ron Sims. I love retirement. I love being retired. But you know, when uh, I got an email from John Bridge, I learned something that there is, a, in all of my years when I was elected and living in this community, I realized that there was the family of Herb Bridge, when they contact you, no is not going to be part of the discussion. <laughs> So it was an honor to be here. The other thing is that over all the years I was here and elected, you know, I always had to be, you know, I love everybody, and I really do, and I welcome everybody's service. But I need to say this about Rotarians. You know, it's not just here, but when I work for the administration, we go all over the country. But, you know, Rotarians bring a quality that I think every community absolutely needs. And it's called possibility. 
of doing greater things. So I want to personally thank every member of this Rotary and all Rotaries for their incredible service to communities and to this country because we are better because people join the Rotary not necessarily to have a good time, but to pull up their sleeves, pull on their shoes, and get good work done for people in need of the service. So I want to say personally, thank you for doing that. Winners in life. You know, it's, uh, I, uh, you know, in retirement, my wife has decided that one of the things we're going to do is I can no longer talk about a trip we're going to take. I mean, she doesn't want me to talk. She says, we shall do. And so I happened to be asked to go to Italy, which was a, a really fun experience in Bellagio. Lake Blasio and Chomo, and uh, so she, the, uh, she said, I'm going to join you. And I had never been in Italy. Normally, I would fly to Italy and fly back, but I would never tour. So she said, no, we're going to tour. And tour we did. And um, but I'll never forget Florence. I loved Rome. I adored Florence. Not just the food. It's just something magical about Florence. But I learned something about a person. You know, if you walk in, there's an area. Uh, up, it's really small. small. You think it would be a huge museum, but it's not. It's just small. When you walk in to see the sculpture of David done by Michelangelo. And you walk in, and then way in the distance, you see the sculpture of Michael, that Michelangelo did of David. And you walk very slowly, and then very slowly. And then when you get to the sculpture, you walk around it again and again and again. It is so mesmerizing. It so catches you. There is just something about it that's exquisite to body and soul, and you don't want to leave it. It is so magnificent. Michelangelo. Michelangelo found on the side of a road in a farm working on another sculpture that was not his. But he had some practice sculptures, and a very wealthy person found him. Michelangelo would not exist today if it wasn't for the fact that somebody gave a doggone about a stranger, a young man whose talents had never been realized, who was brought in and allowed to express his art form, and all of a sudden, we have a David because a stranger found somebody everybody else had given up on. Everybody else, except one person. And that's when I think about the winners for life. They're saying, oh, you know, yes, but the roads have been difficult and there are challenges ahead. And I look at the winners of life and say, well, one of you is going to be Michelangelo because we're waiting for another one. I think about those artists called impressionists who were not part of the people who had education and training and wealth had a disdain for the Impressionist artists. They found their art to be so imprecise. And so the Impressionists gathered themselves and they formed a, not a, you know, they, they rented a place and every year they would give the, their artwork and now Impressionist art is more valuable than any other art form. Everybody gave up on them too. They were not necessarily the group that you'd want to hang with. They had their unique idiosyncrasies. They were, but their art. When winners for life, I want one of you to be our new art form. I want you to be one of our impressionists, somebody who takes art to a scale forever. Because I don't want you to win for life. I want you to win for centuries. I want you to be the difference. And you're going to say, oh, not me. Can I be? And I would say, why not you? Why not you? You know, when you, I was sitting in a White House meeting. It was a White House event. We had the meeting ahead of time, but I was white in an event. Sitting next to Quincy Jones. And Quincy Jones was talking. And he said several things that I found interesting. First, he said, schools don't love me anymore. He's not a STEM person. He was just a musical person. He just loved music. 
And he said, my brother and I would stand up, we would, we would in the evening look out the window of our house next to Garfield High School. And all I would say to Richard is, I want people to love my music. And Richard would say, all I want to be is a lawyer. Now Richard today is a federal district judge. And Quincy Jones' music is heard all over the world. But when you look at where they came from and the obstacles they had to overcome, wow, they believed in themselves. And I want our winners in life to believe in yourself, to be extraordinary, to achieve what people don't think you can achieve, to be what you want to be, no matter what is in front of you, Rotarians have stood behind you and said, you have what it takes. You have what it takes. I have three sons. I love them. I've loved them all their lives. I like them now because they're financially emancipated. <laughs> but when the first one was born, Douglas, and I always tell this story because it just seemed to be emblematic of the other two, when I remember you know, it was a time when they asked fathers to come into the birthing room for their first birthing experience. And I was, I joined. I said, oh, yes, I, I'm going to participate in the birthing experience, you know, the push, 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 and the pop, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So I went in, and I remember walking down the hallway, and I had the thing over my head, a little bow this way. And the nurse said, no, Mr. Sims, it goes over your mouth, not over your head. The, um, <laughs> I got in the room with, and, and, and picked a name out of thin air. I just started saying, go, Doug. I, I didn't know what else to say. I didn't know it was going to be a boy or a girl. I just said, go, Doug. Why did that? It's beyond me. Go, Doug. Not push, push, push. Go, Doug. Go, Doug. And I remember all of a sudden the nurses said, like, go, Doug. And the doctor says, here comes Doug. Here comes Doug. I said to my wife, wasn't that great? I did a great job. She said, that was the, he said, that was the most irritating experience I've ever had in my life. But out Douglas came, and it was a strobing umbilical cord. I remember the doctor saying to me, I'm going to give you the scissors to cut it. And I had an epiphany. The more umbilical cord, the better his chances. Douglas almost became the first person in medical history to be, have a four-foot drying umbilical cord. <laughs> doctor said, no, 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 here. And then cut it. So I did, and then there's this absolute moment of terror. And all of a sudden, he starts breathing. I promised my kids a better life. But I realized as I got older that their better life would be dependent upon the better lives of other people and the support other people had in their lives. We had people over our house all the time. I remember one time this kid walking in our house, I finally said to Doug, I don't know him. Your mom doesn't know him. Who is he? He said, he's a friend of a friend. I said, well, can you bring your friend of a friend down to introduce us? I mean, just say, I know his name. I said, it's not every day you have strangers walking in your house and nobody seems to claim him. Our issue with our friends' friends was I think it's important that we recognize in society that we all come from different places. And that sometimes something very small helps build a bridge to something greater. That we all want a sense that people believe in us, that we have purpose, that people want us around, that we are a part of something. My son did volunteer me to be on a, on a Mount Rainier climbing team. I'll never forget him. I never forgive him either. I remember my oldest, you know, he's a librarian, but he never read books. I don't know how that worked. Um, got letters all the time from his school, yet he has this quiet demeanor. But his letter from the school said, thank you for Mr. Sims for volunteering to be in the Mount Rainier climb. I remember that letter. I said to my wife, look what the status did to me at this time. It was always something he did. But I remember the Mount Rainier climb because there are lessons on Mount Rainier that have to be taught to communities and to organizations. And it's very, very clear. You know, when you're on the side of that mountain, when you're on the side of the mountain where the clouds come and flirt with you, they kiss you and they dance and they scoot away. And I was on a rope team with three young women and they were just pulling me up the mountain. And I remember how wonderful it was to be pulled up a mountain. <laughs> I remember looking at the horizons and there was no horizon. And at night sitting on the side of a, of a you know, you're in a, just in the snow. And, it's a glacier, and you can touch the stars. You can touch them. 
The air is so fresh. But what I learned on the side of that mountain is that everybody counts on a rope team. You are as fast as the slowest member and as strong as the weakest member. Everybody counts. What you did today, both with, and Rotarians do this all the time, but what it means to the students that are winners for life today is you're on a rope team. Let me tell you what that means. That means that there's going to be a mountain that you're going to ascend. It's your mountain. It's your mountain. It's your mountain. There are no horizons because you can see forever. And when you're on top of that mountain, you can touch every single star, every one of them. You know, you'll probably say, well, not me. And I'm going to say, but why not you? You know, there was a clerk who sat in an office. And that's all he was was a clerk. He was just a clerk, you know, counting tabs. But today I enjoy him because he all of a sudden ran, began to redefine the entire universe and his name was Albert Einstein. A person that everybody said, oh, he's just a clerk. Just a clerk. Just a clerk. I mean, he's just Albert. And now he's a person who has changed the course of our science and our view of science and the role of humanity in it. So you can be, you can limit yourself to being, you can limit yourself, but Albert Einstein made a decision not to. And I want to tell the winners for life, never limit yourself. Just push as hard as you can, as fast as you can, and be what you can, because you are essential. And I want you to be essential to this community, because I want you to be what I saw in Florence. I want you to be the Michelangelo's. I want you to be the person who came out of nowhere the, and made a decision on the huge, they have a huge, 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 it's bigger than a cathedral, it's extraordinarily big, but they couldn't figure out how to put a dome on it. And this one person came out of nowhere and said, here is the math that will hold the dome up. And people all of a sudden realize that domes don't have to fall in. They can actually be held, and today we use similar math, but we didn't know his formula. A person out of nowhere who just walked down the street and said, I have a solution. I have a solution. So be the solution. That's what Winners for Life do. They are the solution. Whether it is helping me in my backyard know that how to plant my garden, whether it is telling me how to avoid being stung by the beehives in my backyard, if it's telling me that it's actually a weed, not a flower. Uh, you know, those things are very helpful. They're small, but they're meaningful. Or whether it means that you aspire to be a great writer, whether you aspire and want to be a great writer. There are books in you. There are artwork in you. There are songs in all of you. There are stories you can tell. There are things that you can do as a part of this community. I want us to be Florence. I want to see that the whole group of people who lived in the citizenry here can marry everybody to a common purpose and build something as extraordinary as that city is. That you can be in Istanbul, that you can be at Jerusalem, that you can be on the Masada and see what it means to have courage and what it means to stand up with your convictions. I want you to be all of that. And I'm not trying to tell you, I, I want you to be that. You stood up here and I went, wow, wow, wow. And you're saying, well, you know, it was a crowded stage. I want to say, wow, 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 wow. You were beautiful. You were beautiful. You were David come alive. That expression and that feeling that you could be, that you were a part of something. That's what it means to be a winner for life. And in closing, I read my report cards. I read my report cards. They're no longer readable because I destroyed every report card I read. <laughs> I saw nothing good about me on any report card. Nothing good. Teachers were doing evaluation. I had not one, I only had Ron Miller in fifth grade and Spokane Hutchinson in my senior year, say anything good about me on a report card. I had, I mean, you know, I, I thought they all liked me. 
I didn't realize that they wanted me to be kicked out of school in fourth grade. I didn't know that. And they recommended my parents that I not long be publicly educated. I remember being told when my senior year when I applied for college, I got accepted in six weeks. All of a sudden, they, you know, they were saying he is too, not, he's not a college material. He doesn't have any capacity. He's not going to be innovative. He's not a good citizen of the school, even though he's being elected all the time. I had no idea that there was a huge gap between those who taught me and my own personhood. And I thought about that as I read those report cards and said, I didn't like you either. I didn't like you, but it wasn't. It was just hurt. I began to recall all the times when I told I was couldn't, but I had incredible parents who told me I will. And there's a difference. In this place today, Rotarians have told you you can be, not you can't, that you can be. I never, ever, ever had anybody do that to me. Not until I got out of high school. Not once, not once did any of my teachers tell me I could be something. There wasn't an organization of Rotarians telling you could do that. I had my parents striving really hard to make sure that happened, make sure it happened. Some of their friends did, but by it was a lonely journey. So I want to tell the winners for life, you have the Rotarians in this room, that's who's backing you up. And you look at the people in this room, they are accomplished individuals. These are the people, if you're going to go to battle, you want them with you. If you want to succeed, those are the people with you. When my mother was 88 years old, I said to my mom, Mom, the President of the United States personally asked me to work for her. My parents were civil rights activists. And I didn't even know my last name was Sims because we were called so many other names. And they fought, and they fought, and they fought. And things changed in the community I lived in. So when I said to her, Mom, the first black president of the United States asked me to work for him, she had the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful smile. Winners for life. One day you will be back up here, and everybody in this room will still be here. And you'll be <laughs> 25 and 30 and 40 years old, and we will do what my mother did. We remember you were the winners for life, and you will bring smiles to our lives. Thank you. You can ask me anything. No, I am not running for re-election ever again. Ron, I, I get, Skip Roland, how you doing, Skip's brother? Good seeing you. Always a pleasure. I got to ask you a personal question. Yes. How is your mom? My mom and my two brothers and my dad are in heaven. Thank you for asking. Well, you know your mom was my mentor. Yep. And I, I love her as I love her memory. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Pete. We went to college together, and Pete, you cannot ask me anything about my performance in college. demonstrations and we had a lot of student activists and so forth and I was editor of the paper at the time and I recall you as being a leader and a catalyst and one that brought people together and I was wondering if you could share with us kind of some of those insights from way back then. The, uh, at Central Washington we had a demonstration per day uh, and passionate ones and we uh, there were so many issues to take on, uh, so many. Um, but we had a, actually a great paper. Pete was there, uh, and he made a, a huge difference. 
Dr. Brooks was our president of the school, and although he couldn't understand why we were demonstrating all the time, he never, ever discouraged it. We had professors who joined us too, which really helped. Some of them were tenured, which even helped us better. The, uh, but here's what I learned. Uh, it was a time when, when it was welcomed we went through a period of a metamorphosis, I think. We went from hostility by some of the people to actually saying that we just wanted to freely express our hopes. That's what our demonstrations were. You know, we wanted war to end. We wanted women to have rights. We wanted to be able to vote under 18 years of age. We, we, it was, you know, we deplored the death of Dr. King. We deplored the death of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, it was a age of expression. I worry about it being lost uh, today. We weren't, I don't think we were strident because there were so many people of different philosophies and persuasions and races and religions and I always thought that was a unique period because people coalesced around an issue. DC is a surreal experience today. i not offending anybody but it is, nobody, it's hard to see people engaging each other. I mean, I, I'm in a, my wife's Filipino. You talk about trying to engage, she's an extended family that goes on forever. I'm in a nuclear family. And she eats fish. I've learned to eat fish. She eats rice. I've learned to eat rice. Um, Nobody could have found it more difficult to find a collaborative way. I happened to just love her. That really helped a lot. Uh, but I mean, the, the work it took, and it was hard work. Two different cultures, really two dramatically different cultures. She speaks four languages. I don't speak, I speak one and not well. And in her, in her school system, if you only spoke four languages, if, if you only spoke one language, the bulbs didn't burn too brightly, which is how she's treated me for all the years of my marriage. The, um, but I, it was just a wonderful period. I would like to see that harmonizing again. I miss that. We are, the, we are the world's grand experiment, to be really blunt. This nation is the world's grand experiment. Never before in human history has a nation achieved economic and military superiority as we have without a common gene pool. Without a common gene pool. We are the world's grand experiment, and people somehow or other got a problem with that? I would go, hold it a second. Let's revisit who we are. No, we are a nation where no, everybody got here by boat, plane, and land bridge. Excuse me, all the skirmishes we're having today are ridiculous skirmishes. We fought the Irish coming here, we fought the Jewish people coming here, we fought the Greeks. I mean, we fought everybody coming here. The Indians lost the war totally, so that's why you know, we got here. I want to say time out, everybody. It's time for common sense. Great nations don't do what we do today. They don't fuss over the trivial stuff. They go out and they aspire. They aspire. I want to see a nation that gets up and tells people we're going to feed all the hungry in the world as a goal. We're going to not ruin the beauty that we've been given in terms of our climate. That we can be a prosperous nation. That every kid can win. Every kid who goes to school is valuable. I want to see that nation. That's why we were founded. That's why we're the experiment. Doggone it. I am mad at all the... Uh, <laughs> I almost lost my religion there. Go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Sims, I, I know a lot of these students in the room have persevered through um, times in their lives where they didn't think they could do something, and I'm guessing you have too in your career. Could you give us an example of something in your career where you thought, oh my gosh, I, I know I'm right, but this is really difficult. Am I going to be able to do it? You know, it's really interesting, but it, it all seems easy now. It was never easy. I got hit by a car. I don't know, the car just hit me. It just, I looked up and there the car was. And I thought it was out of school for two months. You know what it's like to play catch up at a school that doesn't want you to catch up? I mean, I didn't even, I just thought that was normal. I mean, I was in a panic attack. It was third grade. I thought I was going to have to go to third grade twice. Uh, 
and I remember that. I remember not be, you know, I had people from my parents' church were helpful, but everybody kind of said, you were at fault by getting hit in a crosswalk by a car. I will never forget that. I mean, I'll never forget that. I just never will forget that. I just felt like they wanted me to, they wanted the car to win and me to lose. Matter of fact, I am absolutely certain from my report cards that if that was their choice, the car would have won and I would have lost. I fell out of the car door when I was in North Dakota. I saw a, I grew up in the age of choo-choo trains, you know, and then they changed over to diesel. So my parents, in, the, in those days, because there was no public accommodations, you had to leave Spokane, you could get gas, but you couldn't get in any hotels or restaurants. So you packed your food and you drove three days back to the East Coast where my parents were from. So I saw a choo-choo train and wanted a better view, so I opened the door and out the door I fell. Bounced out the rear tire and panic hit me. I'm in North Dakota, I got up and started running after the car. My father kept telling my mother, Lydia, that she said, James, Ronnie is running up the highway. And, uh, I was, you know, and I remember though that we went to all these places. I didn't realize, and this was my parents' issue, we were turned down by doctors six times who would not treat, uh, where most of my scalp was gone. They would not treat me. I, I was worthless to them. And then a group of nuns at a hospital told us to go in the back, and that's how it was. People took an oath to save me, and they didn't. So you grow up in a period of time when you're devalued, and you know you are, and you stand up anyway. So I look and say that the students in this room were given value today. There's nothing honest more important than to be young and valued. Nothing. I had parents, they valued me. Their friends valued me. But nothing is more important than to be valued as a young person. One more question. Ron, you've spoken movingly and powerfully of the influence that your mother and father had on you growing up. And I agree, valuing young people uh, is extremely important. Um, I met one father of one of our winners for life. Um, I don't know how many other fathers of our winners for life are here. There are a lot of mothers, a lot of uh, you know, single, single mother, um, um, mothers of, of the winners for life who have done a terrific job of raising these kids. But how important do you think it is to re-engage fathers in the lives of our young people, and spe especially in some of our most troubled communities? And, and what kinds of things can we do to, to help, to help you know, rebuild fatherhood and re-engage fathers to be role models and to give value to the young people? Um. Fatherhood is a tough task, as every father in this room knows. Um, I would be a young man still if I didn't have to be a dad. Um, <laughs> here's what, but here's what I think. You're not going to find fathers in everybody's lives. Uh, a lady wrote us a note to my wife saying that she liked the fact that in her son's lives, my wife and I ended up being very much a part of their adult, their, their experience. So I tell people that it isn't necessarily the father, it is being able to have an adult who cares about you in your life, no matter who you are. I think the worst thing is, and we see it uh, in some fields of, we call epigenetics, what influences behavior, and our genes are not constant, they're altered all the time, and then, and there's things that we do behaviorally because of all that alteration that takes place and one thing that we realize is having, um, we used to call it extended families, but welcoming communities where everybody has some sort of ownership of the kids. So you don't have to be the father to be the coach, to be the tutor, to be the person that the kid can talk to, take them to the store. Uh, you don't, and I think that men in particular, um, I can't speak from, as a woman, so I only speak as a man, that men in particular should play a re-engaging role in their communities with every kid. In Mount Baker, there was a shooting. There was a shooting. Nobody was injured. It was by John Muir Middle School. 
And everybody came, and Norm Rice was mayor, and everybody was angry at the fact that there was a gang fight three minutes before the elementary school bell rang, and people shot. And a lady stood up after an hour of heated meeting when everybody wanted to be tough, and she said, my son, that is my, one of my sons was, a, was one of the people involved, and everybody booed her, and somebody said, hold it, let her speak. She said, my son wanted to mow lawns, and nobody hired him. My son wanted a tutor, and there were no tutors. My son went down to Rainier Playfield to play baseball, and he was cut. My son went down to the basketball court, and he was cut again. My son went to the library, and there was nobody wanting to help him. My son wanted to learn how to read, and nobody was there to read. I actually went on and on and on and on about Mount Baker, a community that I love. And I'll never forget four people in that community made a decision that we were going to establish a fund to send people to school. Last year, they gave a quarter million dollars per year, and they're doing that every year now because people have endowed it so well. And we find kids whose road was most difficult. But the thing that was so indicting was that there were no males involved in her son's life. He was a stranger in his own community. So I tell people, don't complain. If you're not breaking sweat and getting out of your community, you don't have a right to complain about what's happening to other people. If you want to be involved in your community, get out of that easy chair, quit watching the games on TV, and engage the lives of people who could really benefit from what you do. There's nothing wrong with volunteerism. There's nothing wrong with... And, and it's a little, it takes only a little amount of time. But oh, wow, you get far more back than you will ever give to a young person. You'll get far more. Just get busy. That's what men need to do. That's what women need to do. That's what communities need to do. We need to care. Today, you demonstrated what caring's about. All of you did. You're celebrating caring. My God, you know, make it infectious so that it becomes something we, you, you, I, it'd be great for some of you to say, I am so tired. Every day, I got to care about somebody. Hey, that is a good thing to be doing. But thank you for your question, and thank you for all that you are. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.